purification or isolation of DNA from plant and animal cells. So, um, the learning outcomes of this session comprise that the basic strategy for DNA isolation for most species, whether it is bacteria or plant or animal uh, cells, the basic strategy more or less remains the same with certain modifications depending on the type of the source cell. For example, if you take the plant cells, we know that the plant cells have cell wall, while the animal cells do not have an outer envelope. And therefore, the basic treatment over there would be different. One of the stages of the modification, therefore, is the cell lysis stage itself, as the cell envelope constitution can vary from that of the prokaryotes. The second important criteria of specific modifications depends on what are the basic constituents, a mixture of constituents, mixture of biomolecules present in the cells from, the, from which the DNA is to be extracted. So this is important as one needs to know whether one has to deal with only proteins or one has to deal with carbohydrates, proteins, DNA, RNA. So what is more, whether carbohydrates is more or whether proteins is more, depending on that, you would have to have slight changes in the protocol. The assessment of the quality and the quantity of the isolated DNA is needed depending on the use of the isolated DNA. Now let us look at the basic workflow of how DNA is isolated from plants. So the source of plant cells could be in vitro cultures. Now when you use in vitro cultures, you can also have uh, single cell suspensions and if they are single cell suspensions what is needed to be done is that the suspension can be taken and centrifuged and what one would get as pellet is the cells. So therefore removal of the supernatant will leave only the pellet with the single cells and therefore from such single cells it is easy to obtain the DNA. Or what can be done is Adult field plants, that means parts of adult field plants can be taken and processed to isolate DNA. Greenhouse grown plants can also be taken to do the same. What has been uh, understood is that leaf is a very good source of DNA because the leaf uh, is easier to handle and process compared to other parts of the plant. So the first step generally is harvesting the plant cells. Now, if one is growing it in vitro, then first, of course, the growth of the culture is important and then harvesting the plant cells. If you're taking directly from the field, then one just needs to ensure that the uh, one just needs to take the plant part and process it for uh, isolation of DNA. One needs to homogenize the plant cells for the simple reason is because the cells adhere to each other through middle lamellae and so when one gets single cells it is easier to uh, disrupt the cell wall to get the cell extract. Then of course what needs to be done is cell lysis. With cell lysis what one gets is the cell extract and uh, in the cell extract one would have the various constituents present within the cell and therefore at that point of time it is important to maintain the DNA integrity which means that one should ensure that the DNA does not get uh, broken down or denatured. Then of course from the cell extract the DNA will have to be purified. So this can be either removal of other constituents or separation of the DNA from the other constituents. Thereafter the DNA can be precipitated and the precipitated DNA then can be resuspended in an appropriate buffer. Now when we say appropriate buffer, the buffer should not just maintain the pH but it also generally has EDTA and EDTA ensures that uh, it chelates magnesium ions and magnesium ions are needed by nucleases to cleave the DNA or to break, break down the DNA. 
So with the presence of EDTA, magnesium will not be available for nucleases to be active. And so that becomes a buffer in which the DNA can be stored for a longer period of time. Now, therefore, the strategy first step would be cell wall disruption. In case of the plants, we know that the cell wall is made up of cellulose and hemicellulose. And hence, one of the ways is by using specific enzymes that can digest the cell wall, leaving either the spheroplasts or the protoplasts. So therefore, enzyme digestion is something that has to be standardized. Effectively, how much amount of how much amount of enzyme to be used or concentration of enzyme to be used and for how long? That is something that has to be uh, uh, standardized and it may vary from plant to plant and it may vary within the plant itself the um, the tissue that is used for uh, isolating the DNA. Then one can also go in for mechanical grinding, grinding and this is more commonly used. So what one does is using dry ice or liquid nitrogen the uh, plant tissue is uh, powdered is made into a fine powder and that fine powder is then used for isolation of DNA. So the cell wall gets disrupted uh, as one crushes the plant tissue in the pestle and mortar with liquid nitrogen or dry ice. After the cell wall disruption, one goes in for cell membrane disruption. The cell membrane disruption can be carried out by sodium dodecyl sulfate. This as we know is an anionic detergent. And this anionic detergent is able to remove lipids from the bilipid membrane, thereby uh, ensuring cell lysis. In case of plant systems, one also uses what is called a cetyl trimethyl ammonium bromide, commonly called as CTAB. And the method that uses CTAB is known commonly as CTAB method. Now, this CTAB addresses two things. One, is that it addresses the presence of more carbohydrates in plant cells. So when you have a high amount of carbohydrates, what has been observed is that when DNA comes into the aqueous layer, then the entire aqueous layer is highly slimy. And so handling that becomes difficult. So in order to uh, actually separate out the DNA from the carbohydrates present in the cells, CTAP can be used. Now, the question is how and why CTAB is used in such a condition. The CTAB per se is able to interact with nucleic acid to form an insoluble complex. So, it means that all DNA of the plant cell will interact with CTAB to form a complex aggregate and that complex aggregate on centrifugation will settle down into a pellet. So, therefore, the Carbohydrates and the proteins will remain on the supernatant, but to ensure that all proteins are removed or most proteins are removed, one also goes in for carrying out phenol chloroform step after the CTAB step. And finally, of course, after the centrifugation and you get three different phases, one collects the aqueous layer because the aqueous layer will contain the DNA and the RNA. And at this stage, one can add RNAs to remove RNA from the aqueous layer. If one doesn't want to do it, then RNAs is not used. But then nucleic acids are present in the aqueous layer. And hence, that aqueous layer is subjected to organic solvent precipitation. So most commonly, what is used is either ethanol or isopropyl alcohol. So DNA precipitation is done by using chilled organic solvent. So therefore, as you can see, the entire process is beginning with cell wall disruption to cell membrane disruption to phenol chloroform step and finally to the ethanol uh, precipitation of DNA to concentrate the DNA in the sample. Post this, of course, the DNA that is obtained is resuspended in an appropriate buffer. So generally, the tris EDTA buffer or in water. And then this DNA is checked for quality and quantity. And we all know that quality can be measured by um, the A260 by A280 
ratio. If the ratio is 1.8 and close to 1.8, then the DNA sample is pure. Moreover, because DNA absorbs light at 260 nanometer, using that concept, one can also calculate the amount of DNA that is being isolated. So, after the uh, isolation protocol, one always generally goes in for quality and quantity assessment of the DNA obtained. Now, just looking at the process of using CTAB, a cell extract is treated with CTAB. So, this CTAB will go and bind preferentially to the nucleic acid. So, therefore, you have the nucleic acid CTAB complex being formed. On centrifugation, as a pellet, what one gets is nucleic acid CTAB complex. And what is present in the supernatant is the carbohydrates and the proteins, which is then discarded. Now, these cells which are present, uh, sorry, these nucleic acids which are present at the, in the pellet, complexed with CTAB, is again brought into suspension by using one molar NaCl. And when one uses one molar NaCl, the CTAB is removed from the nucleic acid. So, therefore, now this resuspended pellet has the DNA which can be precipitated out. So, therefore, this is subject to ethanol precipitation. And if one wants to remove the RNA as well, then ribonuclease treatment. Thereby, eventually what one gets is pure DNA. How pure a DNA it is, like mentioned earlier, one can check it by carrying out A260 by A280 absorbance ratio. Now here, when one uses NaCl as mentioned, it breaks the nucleic acid CTAP complex. The buffer contains EDTA to prevent DNA degradation because we know that EDTA chelates magnesium ions and magnesium ions are required by enzymes that break down the DNA. Specific raisins have been used in many kit-based isolation of DNA protocols from plant sources and these raisins are specifically able to interact with the or bind to the polysaccharides and thereby, the amount of polysaccharides, if in a cell, if in a plant cell is high, then the raisins capture that, um, those polysaccharides so that they do not interfere with isolation of DNA. Now, many a times what has been observed is plants having a lot of secondary metabolites, especially for example, phenolics can get oxidized and give rise to a brown coloration. So, to prevent uh, a more and more oxidation what one can add is PEG or PVP and because of this you would have less brown pigments being formed because of phenolic oxidation. So as you can see these are small modifications that can be made to ensure that the plant DNA sample is obtained in a more or less pure form. Isolation of DNA from animal cells is even more simpler than plant cells for the simple reason that animal cells do not have a cell wall around it. So one step of cell wall disruption is completely removed. Now, one can use muscle cells, one can use a liver, one can use blood, one can use skin. All of these tissues can be used for isolation of DNA. So, what is first done is that the tissue is digested and grinded in a lysis buffer. Now, what, uh, when one does that, of course, what would definitely get is a cell extract. And from the cell extract, what is done is protein degradation and protein precipitation. So, protein as a contaminant present in the sample is removed. And then, of course, one goes in finally for DNA precipitation because this is what is required in the pure form. Now, the lysis buffer that is used generally contains NaCl, Tris EDTA and of pH 8 and STS or Triton X100. Generally, for animal cells, a non-anionic detergent can be used. So, Triton X100 is more commonly used because one doesn't have the cell wall around it. NaCl maintains the isosmolarity and we know that tris EDTA maintains the pH of 8. Then once one gets the cell extract, it is uh, 
further subjected to proteinase K treatment. So, proteinase K is a protease that will break down larger protein molecules into smaller polypeptides and those smaller polypeptides can easily be extracted by phenol. One can also use guanidinium thiocyanate to precipitate out the proteins and thereby you have basically at the second step the protein degradation and the protein precipitation occurring. Now the aqueous layer having removed the protein would have DNA and RNA. If one doesn't want the RNA, RNAs can be added to degrade the RNA. Otherwise one can keep both DNA and RNA and carry out precipitation and the precipitation is done using chilled isopropanol. So therefore this is one simple uh, method that is used to isolate DNA from animal cells. There are simple modifications that have been observed depending on what is the uh, uh, tissue, whether it is muscle or liver or blood or skin. Say for example, we take blood. Blood has both RBCs, platelets and WBCs. But from which of these cells will you get the DNA? It is definitely the WBCs. So therefore, once blood has been collected, what is done is that using an acidic condition, one tries to uh, lyse the RBCs and on lysis of RBCs, uh, you would have the hemoglobin coming out. So several washes are needed to remove all the hemoglobin from the WBCs and then WBCs, which is generally white in color, is resuspended in buffer and then following that, one goes in for cell wall, uh, sorry, a cell membrane disruption and then protein uh, denaturation followed by DNA precipitation. So once the DNA has been precipitated, it can be either suspended in TE buffer, Tris EDTA buffer, or it can be resuspended in the water itself. So let us make the conclusions. For isolating DNA from plant sources, cell extracts obtained by disrupting cell wall and cell membrane is generally done by using the CTAB method. CTAB binds to the nucleic acids and hence precipitates on centrifugation, leaving of course the carbohydrates, proteins, etc. in the supernatant. Isolating DNA from animal cells needs disruption of the cell membrane to get a cell extract, which then further can be processed to obtain just the DNA. Guanidinium thiocyanate can be used for isolating DNA from both plant and animal cells as it removes the proteins effectively and complexes with the or, or enables the DNA to become or to have a higher affinity for silica. So one can also carry out column chromatography using guanidinium thiocyanate to purify the DNA. The pre basic protocol therefore for isolating DNA from plant and animal cells is similar to that used for bacteria with modifications based on presence of cell wall and biomolecules present in the cells. Thank you.